Jewish channels we can review. More arrests in last week's Jewish attacks on Palestinians, the young singing sensation making his presence felt on the national stage, Jews in the Air Force, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Arrests continue to be made in response to two unrelated attacks against Palestinians by Israeli Jews in Jerusalem and the West Bank last week, which Israel's Vice Prime Minister has called, quote, terrorist attacks. The firebombing of a Palestinian taxi in the West Bank that injured six, including two four-year-old children, has produced three arrests of two 12-year-old Jewish boys and one 13-year-old Jewish boy from the West Bank settlement of Bat Ayin. The settlement of Bat Ayin has a history of producing attacks on Palestinians. In recent years, Jewish residents have been caught on camera stoning Palestinian hikers. In 2002, several Jewish residents were arrested for attempting to firebomb a Palestinian school. In the Jerusalem mob beating of three Arab teenagers last week as hundreds looked on, Haaretz reported this week that the two prime suspects are a teenaged man and a teenage woman from the ultra-Orthodox community, and several others are ultra-Orthodox, and that the prime female suspect was a student at the Beis Yaakov seminary until just a few months ago. And the New York Times reports that Israel's education ministry has ordered all schools to teach lessons about the Jerusalem beating. Moving on to arrests of those who've attacked Israelis, 74 people have been given one-year suspended sentences in Egyptian court for their roles in the attack on the Israeli embassy there in September of 2011. In addition to those 74, one young man was sent to a juvenile facility, and a former police officer who fled the country was sentenced to five years in prison in absentia. But if there's good news for Israel this month, it's likely in the form of baseball. The World Baseball Classic is the every four years international competition organized by Major League Baseball that unsurprisingly has yet to have an Israeli team compete. But there's renewed hope for Israel's efforts to enter the 2013 competition. Israel has been invited to be one of 16 countries playing in next month's qualifying round, from which four winners will enter the World Baseball Classic. And they've got some real major leaguers playing. Chicago White Sox third baseman Kevin Euclid has said he'll play for Israel if he's healthy. He joins retired major leaguers Sean Green and Gabe Kapler, who will be player coaches, and Brad Osmus, who was coaching the team. But speaking of Jewish overachievers hoping to make it big on the world stage, one young man from Chicago has made it to the top 24 of national talent show America's Got Talent. Edan Pinchot is the yarmulke wearing young singer drawing accolades from all of the competition's three judges. Rebecca Honig Friedman reports. Oh, this has got to be the good He's the 14 year old boy taking America by storm with his soulful singing, a good, good life. winning smile, and his yarmulke. Idan Pinchot is an Orthodox Jew and a semi finalist on NBC's America's Got Talent. He's already made it to the top 24 in the competition, among the many thousands who've entered across the United States. America's Got Talent won't allow on-camera interviews while contestants are sequestered for the remainder of the competition, but in an exclusive phone interview with the Jewish Channel, the young singer spoke about his decision to wear a yarmulke on stage. I mean, we were just thinking that if I was going to do this, I was going to do it with my kippah on, and we felt like um, it it kind of just be almost like an experiment mm -hmm. to see if we could, if I could kind of like pursue this career almost with my kippah on. Right. And I mean, so far everyone's been really accepting of it, and so far it's, it's been good. As he was preparing for this week's performance, Idan spoke about his chances to win it all. I definitely like to think that <laughs> I have um, a good chance. I mean, I feel like with this performance and with my last one and with how really dedicated my fans are. Um, I think that I definitely have a chance. Uh, that being said, um, it is the semifinals, and there's some crazy, crazy good talent this week. Mm -hmm. So it'll, it'll definitely be a step up, and it'll be a lot harder than last time. But I think that with my performance, I think it's, it, I hope it's going to be enough at least. Interviews with Idan, his parents, and his acquaintances told the story of the 14-year-old's rapid journey from obscurity to one of television's top-rated shows. He grew up in Skokie, Illinois, with music and singing a consistent presence at home, especially on Shabbat, and he started taking piano lessons at age nine. But it wasn't until a few years ago that his parents realized they had a special talent on their hands. Probably about three and a half years ago or so, I was actually upstairs uh, in the house, and he was playing piano, and he liked to play piano, and he was singing, and I, I honestly didn't recognize who was singing. 
Um, I, I said to my wife, I'm like, who, you know, who is that? She said, that'd be Don. I said, that'd be Don. So it, it's just, I mean, the voice is an incredible thing. It really, um, it, you know, it's not like lessons or anything like that is, is kind of what gave him this. It's just a God-given talent, and it just matured at a certain point, and all of a sudden he just sounded like a pop star. Around that time, Idan told us, his older sister and her friend convinced him to post some videos of himself playing piano and singing on YouTube. When I see your face, not a thing One of those homemade videos, featuring Idan covering a pop song by Bruno Mars, found its way to the Facebook feed of Dovi Stoller. Director of Marketing and Innovation for NCSY, a national youth group run by the Orthodox Union. I think it was like either his first or second video and it had a few hundred um, views and right away I knew this kid was going to be a star and I said he would be perfect for a video. I wasn't sure yet what we could use it for. Stoller ended up putting Idan in a marketing video for an NCSY benefit auction. He flew to Skokie to shoot the video, which had Idan playing and singing a take on John Lennon's Imagine at his home and a local recording studio. Um, and I remember the first thing I noticed when I met him at the studio was how much smaller he looked in real life. Um, and then I was like, wow, this really is a 12-year-old. The Jewish Channel was given exclusive access to these behind-the-scenes videos from the shoot. As they show, despite his young age, Idan came ready to perform. He was so professional, um, and especially as the night went on, um, and he kept getting more tired, and we were all tired, but he just kept going. And I think by the end of the night, he had like fallen asleep on the couch. The video marketed Idan as the Jewish Justin Bieber and went viral. By the time of his bar mitzvah, Idan, then a student at Hillel Torah Elementary School in Skokie, had already made a name for himself in the Jewish community as a talented performer. And we hear practically the whole of Skokie turned out to hear him lay in his bar mitzvah parsha, Tazria. And it wasn't long before those internet videos grabbed the attention of a producer at America's Got Talent, and the show came calling with an invitation for Idan to audition. Idan's father, Dove Pinchot, said that religious restrictions were taken into account before letting Idan audition. Our initial concerns were sort of logistics and whether it could work, because, you know, obviously he doesn't sing on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was, uh, you know, I assumed that would be a huge issue for the show. And we actually sort of, you know, sat down with them and went through the schedule initially and it really turned out that it wasn't, uh, and that it would be over, you know, even before the, the Chagim in the fall, the holidays in the fall. And so it, it just seemed to fit schedule-wise and logistically really, really well. And I have to say, uh, the show has been amazing um, in terms of their, you know, just sort of accommodating some of our basic uh, religious needs. Fast forward some months later, and Idan is now one of just 24 semi-finalists, with a fan base that goes well beyond the Jewish community. Witness his popularity among teenage girls, who've created a devoted following on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag Edenier. Idan's father spoke about what it's like to see his son gain so much popularity. You know, one incredible thing for us has been how he's been received, you know, by the general world in terms of just his personality and and his sort of character and his voice. Another thing which has really been amazing for us is um, how just the entire Jewish community seems to have embraced him. The whole spectrum of, uh, of the Jewish community um, really seems to relate to him, and the fact that he's proud and, and you know, gets up there with his, uh, with his yarmulke on has been really, uh, just really warmly embraced. One Jewish institution that's been supportive is Idan's new high school, Ida Crown Jewish Academy in Chicago. Idan is missing his first week of ninth grade in order to be on the show, and I asked him how he feels about that. I'm, I'm definitely really excited to be starting high school. i uh, definitely nervous now because I'm missing the first week, so I'm not going to really know what's going on, but um, like I said, it's really like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, so... Um, I'll just catch up. <laughs> As we go to air, Idan is getting ready for his performance in the semifinals on NBC. And a popular vote will determine whether he makes it to the final round and a chance to win the million dollar grand prize. 
Reporting for the Jewish Channel, I'm Rebecca Honig Friedman. Thank you, Rebecca. A Jewish figure who's made a massive impact on the world of entertainment is the lyricist behind Fiddler on the Roof, and Meredith Gansman spoke with him about that and a new book. Sunrise, Sunset, If I Were a Rich Man, and of course, Tradition are just some of the lyrics from the famous Broadway musical Fiddler on the Roof written by one of my guests today, Sheldon Harnick. But before we get to one of my favorite musicals, Sheldon and his wife Marjorie are here to discuss their new collaboration, a beautiful coffee table book entitled The Outdoor Museum, Not Your Usual Images of New York. Sheldon and Marjorie, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank That's you a pleasure. For us. What inspired this book? Um, actually, I started working on many photographs for my paintings. I am a painter. One day I showed all of the pictures to Sheldon, or sometimes in between, you know, different trips out uh, with my camera. And he said, wow, some of these are just like poetry. He, he felt very close to them and excited by them. There's one photograph in that book. She was passing a store. And usually those, the models, the dummies, are very elegant, but in, in this one, there's one that's crawling out of the store window, which is terribly <laughs> funny. Right, right. So out came the camera and went. She saw it immediately. New York, this is one of the things in any big city is the homeless. And I happen to feel that Margie's pictures of the homeless are not only very interesting uh, photographically, but they're very compassionate along with the photos are your poems that you've written yeah. and of course we know you from your famous lyrics but were you always a poet at heart? Is this something new for you, a new genre? Now is my chance to write in different forms. So there's a sonnet in there because it's a sonnet about swans, we call it a swanet. <laughs> and there's a haiku <laughs> and there's a constructivist poem and there's, there's different kinds of poetry, which is great fun to write. Sheldon, I, of course, want to talk about Fiddler on the Roof. And 48 years since it made its Broadway debut, it's still a very important piece of art for the Jewish culture. And its lyrics, as I said before, sunrise, sunset, tradition, really resonate. What are some of the memories that you have from that period in writing those lyrics? We thought if we do our job right, too, this will reach out to everybody. Mm -hmm. And one of the rewards of that was the first performance we had when it was all actors Florence Henderson at the intermission came running up to me and she said, Sheldon, this is about my Irish grandmother. And that was, that was a wonderful reward because that's what we were trying to do. To hear more from Sheldon and Marjorie Harnick, tune into the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. There are plenty of exciting careers outside of the Great White Way. One of them is heading off into the wild blue yonder. Christian Neen caught up with Jewish servicemen during the recent Air Force Week. The flight deck of the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum recently hosted the kickoff to Air Force Week in New York City. And in addition to several speeches, award presentations, and a live rescue demonstration over the Hudson River, attendees had the opportunity to examine the aircraft carrier's various planes and helicopters from different eras of military aviation. Many of those visitors were Jewish, and the first plane they saw upon boarding the carrier was an Israeli jet fighter called a kafir, Hebrew for lion cub, its tail carrying the markings of its Israeli Air Force unit, as well as the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps squadrons that were loaned the plane to help train their own pilots. But the U.S. Air Force has had Jewish airmen since it was established as a branch of the military in 1947 and TJC talked to a few of them visiting the Intrepid. First, though, I spoke with Colonel Michael Underkoffler, whose mother is Jewish, and though he is not a practicing Jew, he does maintain strong ties with the Jewish airmen he serves with as commander of the 514th Air Mobility Wing at Joint Base McGuire-Dix Lakehurst in New Jersey. Many Jews served in the Air Force. Uh, a lot of them were motivated when they came back from World War II and they wanted to continue to serve their country. And uh, many prominent Jews helped create the Air Force Reserve. One of those Jewish World War II veterans is retired Brigadier General Elmer Friedberg. A Jew that helped liberate uh, Europe came back and helped form the Air Force Reserve. And uh, as an optometrist in Philadelphia, rose to the rank of one star and didn't make, his, make a star in the medical side. He made it in the line side as a navigator. So uh, there, you know, Many prominent Jews have helped create
create the Air Force that we know today. One of those Jewish reservists currently making a difference in the Air Force's medical services is Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Matson, who commands the 514th's Aeromedical Evacuation Squadron. We have the best job in the Air Force. We get to affect people's lives in such a dramatic way when they're at their lowest point. We get to care for them, save their lives, and bring them back to their families here and to the open arms of, of a grateful nation. So with us, we have our nurses and our techs uh, that pick up these patients, you know, in the worst condition, and we treat them and get them back into the United States. And today we're displaying our equipment. We have uh, the latest simulator that we use for training that keeps the skills and competencies of our nurses and techs up. It's just a phenomenal piece, and we're very fortunate that we were able to uh, acquire it for our training. To see more from Jewish airmen attending the kickoff to Air Force Week at the Intrepid, please tune into the full broadcast edition of the Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. Finally, Time Magazine senior national correspondent Michael Grunwald is making waves with his new book, The New New Deal, an argument that the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act, also known as President Obama's stimulus bill, was a huge success. He spoke with me in studio just prior to heading off to speak at his parents' synagogue. Here are the highlights of that interview. So the basic argument that you're making with, with your book is that the stimulus actually worked. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, pretty much everything that people think they know about the stimulus is wrong. Um, it did, in fact, prevent a depression. In the fourth quarter of 2008, GDP crashed at like a 9% rate. I mean, or that's, it, it, it prevented a worse depression. <laughs> well, no, I mean, yeah. people forget sort of what a depression is, you know. Like, we had 25% unemployment back in the 30s. You know, so this went up to 10%, which is terrible. But, you know, we, had, we lost 800,000 jobs in January 2009. Then we passed the stimulus, and immediately after that, we had the biggest improvement in jobs in 30 years. Not to a very high level. Right. You know, and adding 150,000 jobs a month is not going to make anybody happy. But it really beats losing 800,000 800, in, in a month. I mean, this right. is a, it, right. was, it was a bad situation. Right. And then at the same time, you know, the the stimulus was really the purest distillation of what Obama meant by change. You had all these long-term reinvestments in energy, education reform, health information technology. You had the, the largest infrastructure investment since the Eisenhower administration, the largest middle-class tax cut since the Reagan administration, the largest research investment ever. Um, so this really was, you know, this long-term stuff was happening while the, you know, while the short-term economy was being rescued. But as you say, I mean, you might be about the only person or among <laughs> several people who actually do believe this. It's a lonely this. job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's true. It's funny. Uh, I live in the public policy paradise of South Beach. Um, I, I used to be a reporter at the Washington Post, so I was in D.C. for nine years. But I would say that if I, if I still lived in Washington, I do not think I could have written this book because the groupthink is so strong. And in Washington, just suggesting that the stimulus was anything but this $800 billion joke um, was really like, you can't talk about this thing without sort of snickering and rolling your eyes. Um, I stumbled into it because I write a lot about energy and you know, the United States used to spend maybe two or three billion dollars a year on clean energy. The stimulus poured in 90 billion, just completely right. unprecedented investments in wind, solar, and other renewables, in energy efficiency, in the smart grid, clean coal, electric vehicles, advanced biofuels, the factories to make all this stuff in the United States. Um, and it got me thinking kind of, you know, gosh, this is a complete game changer. I wonder what else is in the stimulus. You can watch the full interview with Michael Grunwald in the weekly news category on the Jewish Channel On Demand on cable. That's all for this week from all of us here at the Jewish Channel. Be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 291, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and now on Comcast Cable in the On Demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.